now to I took my mic on uh, and uh, welcome to this Friday's nature seminar and before I introduce our speaker let the enthusiastic audience settle in uh, I'll just mention some of the talks that we have for the for the re remainder of this uh, series uh, so we have uh, two more left in this Friday seminars this term Next week, if you want more rewilding, we've got James Bullock from Center for Ecology and Hydrology talking about rewilding restoration and the future of nature recovery. So that, that, that should be a, a, very, a very interesting and thoughtful piece. And uh, then on the following Friday, the last one of this term on 1st of December, we've got Laura Martinez-Sous from Q on mycorrhizae and ecosystem functioning. Uh, I'll also mention, uh, not on this series, but on the on, uh on Monday, the 27th of November, we have uh, Julia Jones, she's somewhere there in the audience, uh, over there, uh, who's a visitor from, from Bangor University, and she'll be talking at the Oxford Martin School on is conservation working. So that's a separate registration thing to the Martin School if you want to go to that. But I would highly recommend it because I'm sure it's going to be fantastic. <laughs> uh, and so over to today's present presentation, it's great to welcome Sophie Montserrat from uh, Rewilding Europe, where she's a um, rewilding manager for, for Rewilding Europe. And she did her PhD at Montpellier in France on uh, marine mammals, uh, historical impacts of marine mammals, and then did a postdoc in South Africa on terrestrial mammals, and then was in Aarhus in Denmark uh, as a postdoctoral researcher before moving over to Rewilding Europe uh, last year. And I'm sure we'll hear all about what she's up to now in that. So thank you for joining us. Sir. Thank you so much. Thanks, Jan Winder, and uh, hi, everyone. I'm really happy to be here. Um, thanks for the invitation. I already had really nice conversations with people from the center, so um, it's really a pleasure to uh, to visit. And um, as Jan Winder mentioned, I'm going to um, present some of the work that we're doing at Rewilding Europe, but I'm very much coming here with a double hat because I was uh, in academia not so long ago, and I, I had uh, quite a few years uh, doing research connected to rewilding. Um, so I will present a bit of this personal experience um, between these two fields and hopefully bring some interesting lessons and learnings that I had when I shifted um, to practice and that I think can be interesting to know for, for academics, hopefully. Um, so to start, I think I'll just uh, present a bit of my path because, because it is a bit of a, a personal uh, presentation on the things that I've learned. And I started as an academics um, academic and I was very much working on uh, shifting baselines, so the, the idea that we've lost track of what uh, ecosystems used to look like because we tend to forget uh, over time what is the, the baseline and natural uh, state of this system. I was working on biogeography and especially trying to reconstruct historical distributions uh, and abundance for megafauna. And that led me to the field of rewilding because when you think about the past and you think about what we've lost, you can start thinking about how we can see the future and how we can recover what was lost. So um, from there, um, I started to be connected with, with this idea of rewilding. And then for some reasons, many reasons that I'm not going to go through right now, which you can ask me after, um, I shifted and I, I went to work for Rewilding Europe. I started a year ago and it's been a really nice uh, experience so far. We really like it. This is me. Uh, reintroducing dung beetles uh, in France. And this has been a highlight of my year. You can uh, even know if you would imagine the case of dung beetles being, a, you know, I actually got a lot of satisfaction from this uh, uh, release, maybe more than writing scientific papers. So maybe that tells you uh, something about why I shifted uh, from academia to practice. But it was a very nice um, also example that rewilding is not just about the big cuddly mammals and restoring lynxes and, and bison but also uh, about keystone species at large. And, and this was an example with this young beetle that we're trying to bring back um, functions into ecosystems. And as part of Rewilding Europe, I'm the rewilding manager and I'm focusing on certain part of our work linked to the comeback of wildlife, natural grazing, coexistence, among, among other things. So a lot of my talk will be around these topics, not because this is the only thing Rewilding Europe is doing, but because this is what I'm actually uh, have some experience with. So the first part is just about setting a bit the scene on the um, theoretical knowledge part. And when I started preparing this talk, it was a bit overwhelming because there's so much science uh, coming out or around rewilding. 
So what should I present? What should I be talking about? And then I just decided to narrow it down to what I've actually worked on and what I've been looking at. So it's not total. It's not all the science of rewilding I'm going to talk about. It's very specific to these concepts of shifting baselines um, and trophic rewilding. And first, so uh, image is worth uh, a thousand words. And that's why I chose this first image because I think it gives us a quite a striking um, a uh, reminder of how much our systems in Europe have changed, because this used to be in Europe, um, this scene of, you know, a species that we're used to seeing uh, often, red deer, coming across a straight tusk elephant. This was something that actually happened in Europe. Um, and it was not in a, some, you know, very different climate or habitat. This was uh, in a climate that's very similar to what we have today. So without these species going extinct, we could still have this. And I think that's quite striking and we tend to forget uh, the extent of what we've lost. And it's not just elephants, we also had lions in Europe. Uh, we had the ancestor of our domestic cattle, which is the orc. So a scene like that with um, lion chasing orcs in the forest could very well have happened uh, here or elsewhere in Europe and we, we've lost this. And of course, um, it was not such a long time ago, um, our ancestors did interact with these animals in their daily life and we have proof of that. We have these um, cave paintings that are really striking. These date from 30,000 years ago, but they're for millennia and millennia. Uh, you have several examples across Europe of these cave paintings of people coming back and using the exact same technique and, and, and painting these animals on the wall. And well, first it gives us an idea of what was there. We have, we have paintings of auroch, of bison, uh, woody rhinos and horses and, and lion, but it also gives us an, an impression of the you know, there, there must have been such a strong uh, significance of these animals for an ancestors. And this connection, we've obviously lost it um, in European systems. So it's a strike reminder of that. So this is uh, showing a bit of the data um, on what would have been the species richest of megafauna if these species had not been extinct on the left and what we have today. And that shows us really that the, the perception that these big mammals belong to Africa, or they belong to Southeast Asia, is, is really a construct from historical events that happen that are unrelated to the ecology of these species. Ecologically speaking, these species could be in Europe today, uh, and they're not. And so the result is that in Europe, we do have this amazing landscapes. This is a, an image from a landscape where rewilding Europe is working in, uh, in Spain. This is the area, I didn't know that, but in Europe where you have the least density of people. So you have a lot of potential, you have these beautiful landscapes, but it, they're quite empty. So we have, we have these big theaters, but we don't have the actors that are supposed to play a role in it. And this is a paper that just came out, uh, led by a good friend and ex-colleague of mine, Elena Pies, um, a few days ago. And what they did in this paper, they did use uh, pollen records to reconstruct the structure of past European landscape and of woody habitats in Europe in the last interglacial, which would have been a, a similar climatic um, uh, environment as today, but without humans. And what they show is that uh, the this landscape at that uh, point was not this um, close canopy forest that we can imagine, but was a, an heterogeneous woodland and with lots of patches of open vegetation. And this vegetation was maintained by these large herbivores. And I'm not going to go, whoops, sorry, to go through all the science because there's a lot of it, but there's a lot of science that uh, demonstrates the disproportionate role of megafauna in ecosystems. There's some very good science coming out of this group here, um, uh, for example, on uh, the role of large mammals in, in climate change mitigation and on carbon storage. But there's also a lot of evidence of them having a huge impact on uh, vegetation structure, on seed dispersal, on... Um, fire regimes on, you know, there's a lot of biodiversity also associated to these species. So there's, you know, evidence of uh, dung beetle communities uh, disappearing after the loss of megafauna. Uh, there's even st st studies on uh, pathogen dispersal. So what this all tells us is just this uh, keystone impact that these species have in the ecosystem and that we have lost. And because we have this knowledge now of what we've lost and how much of an impact these species had on, the, on our um, ecosystems, that's where the idea of trophic rewilding comes in. So it's the idea that by restoring these, uh, these 
guild of, of large animals, we will restore these top-down trophic interactions, and that will restore uh, trophic cascades that will eventually promote self-regulating biodiverse ecosystems. So that's the standard definition used for trophic rewilding. But basically, what this image shows, it's you reintroduce this large group of species that are interacting with each other through predator-prey -predator interactions and competition, etc. And they bring back with them environmental processes uh, in yellow here in the middle and environmental structure. And the theory tells you that then you should have a more biodiverse ecosystem that is uh, resilient, able to look after itself, et cetera. And I will add to that um, something that I've worked on uh, just before I stopped working in academia, which was this moral obligation to rewild also that we have in the North. Uh, there's this, um, this couple of papers that came uh, quite close to each other. And I looked at how uh, the burden of megafauna restoration was unfairly distributed across the world, where we have uh, areas in the world that have less resources and less capacity that have to support the burden of living with lions and elephants and tigers, etc. And then um, Ari Taubost looked at it from the legal perspective and also uh, argued that there is a legal responsibility to restore these megafaunas in Europe. And then there's this quote by Tim Flannery that I think just sums it up. He says that the, the moral case is an, as unassailable. It is unacceptable to ask the people of Africa, whose population may reach around 4 billion by 2100, to live alongside lions and elephants while Europeans refuse to do so. And I think we don't even need to go as far as living with lions and elephants. We, we struggle to live with beavers and badgers and foxes. So there is a huge scope there to actually you know, take our part in, uh, in coexisting with those species and bringing them back. So that brings me to um, rewilding European landscapes. And that's where I'll take off the academic hat and uh, take my hat as a uh, practitioner. And as a disclaimer, I am going to present things that are very related to our work at Rewilding Europe. And that's not representing all of rewilding everywhere. There's a lot of you know, organization doing rewilding. You have a lot in the UK, people doing rewilding, and they may or may not recognize the, the, the challenges and the, and the things that I'm going to present now. So bear with me, this is very much uh, focused on our work at Rewilding Europe. So um, first uh, um, constatation in, in, in Europe is that um, the way that nature is managed right now, you have protected areas, national parks and so on, and you also have uh, the network of Natural 2000, which is a place that uh, was, uh, you know, built in the was started in the to, with the the idea to reduce the degradation of of areas and habitats and and maintain what's there, and it has provided um, a lot of benefits in terms of reducing degradation, but it's also really um, a very strict type of conservation and 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 actions that happen there, and it's very hands-on. So it, there's a lot happening in natural cells and area where you, you'll have to really maintain the exact level of, of, of water that you need to save this particular wader bird species, or you'll have to go and mow areas uh, to maintain open habitats, or you have to scrape the floor or plant trees. It's very hands-on and very uh, costly. And there was actually a study that looked at how much money would be needed to manage these natural cells and area that way and uh, it's, there's just not the financing needs are not covered by by eu money we completely lack the fund to actually do that ourselves and manage these areas like this and another thing is that um the bird and the habitat directives which were established in the 1990s uh, they have their their own value but they're also very much based on a compositional approach it's a lot about maintaining species and maintaining habitats in the way that they were uh, back then it does limit further degradation, but it gives very little space for restoration, for moving beyond that, for um, adapting to climate change, for recognizing that species are moving in Europe and that we cannot just have this list of species that we need to maintain in, in a place. So it is, in a way, not very suitable um, for, for actions such as rewilding or just you know adapting to a changing environment as we have today. In parallel to that, we also have a um, huge um, pattern of things that are, um, oh, sorry, I'm missing the word there, um, 
that is happening in the in Europe today. It's uh, rural abandonment, um, and I don't really like the word of abandonment. I think these places are not abandoned. There's still people there, and there's still activities. But we do see um, a move away from rural areas and towards urban areas uh, that has been happening since the 60s. And that does free a lot of space for whatever will happen next. There's a lot of space that is not managed now the way it used to be in the past. And instead of seeing this as a, as a challenge, we can see this as an opportunity. What can we do with these areas? Can we actually let nature come back in these areas? And that's where rewilding finds its, its place also um, in those places where where you have uh, this population leaving. And so that's where rewilding comes in. Um, I do like this, uh, this image because it kind of brings what I was just saying all together. So you have this, this past situation of European landscape where you had this megafauna really um, providing a lot of um, uh, functional roles in the system then human and modernity kind of split this relationship between human and nature into really segregating. You, have, you will have agricultural land and you'll have protected areas and you'll have cities and kind of this really division of, of space. And the idea of rewilding is kind of trying to intertwine this all together and try to reconnect um, human and nature, try to bring back not what was there before exactly, but try to bring back natural processes uh, as much as we can so that we have, um, you know, a nature that can fulfill its role and that is connected with human activity. So the idea is not to exclude humans um, at all, but to intertwine these together. So it is future oriented for sure, but it is learning from the past because we need to know what we lost in order to know what's the potential and what we can recover. It's very much focusing on um, restoring ecosystem processes to promote nature recovery. Uh, the aim is to reduce active human management over time although there will be, you know, at the beginning, some active human management to bring a system on the right trajectory, the right trajectory, that's uh, something that can be de debated, but on a trajectory that we deem is, uh, as more potential to bring back um, natural processes. Um, the idea is to reconnect people with wild nature. There's a lot of work being done around bringing coexistence and 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 a sense of pride and, and livelihood uh, in areas that are rewilded. The idea is that it will be cost effective compared to recurrent management that is really hands on, like I showed before. And there's also more and more um, evidence that it could be a, a nature based solution for climate change mitigation and adaptation. And since I'm coming from uh, rewilding Europe to talk to you today, I'll just present very briefly what the organization is doing. So it's an organization based in the Netherlands, but we work in uh, these landscapes that you see on the screen, 10 different places. Uh, there will be an um, 11th, 11th one uh, announced soon, and the target is to have 15 by uh, the end of the decade. And these landscapes are very big areas. They're at least 100,000 hectares, but sometimes much, much bigger. In, in Spain, it's 850,000 hectares. So rewilding Europe is not working at every area, every place within these landscapes, but it's just a landscape where we generally have action. So we might have pilot sites, we might have tried to bring stakeholders to work together, we might try to influence management. So we work within this landscape, uh, but not obviously in every uh, spot of the landscape because these are very big areas. All the landscapes are locally anchored and led by local teams and local organizations that are connected to rewilding Europe very closely. And all the work is embedded in the local in the local context. Rewilding Europe is also um, managing uh, the European Rewilding Network, which is quite similar to what Rewilding Britain would be doing here. Um, so we have members all over the continent, and uh, the idea is to foster exchanges of knowledge and working together, and meetings and seminars, etc. But these sites are not managed by Rewilding Europe, obviously. And in terms of the pillars of action, um, a very obvious one is bringing back nature and the, the rewilding in rewilding Europe. And that's the one where I'm most involved. So it's focusing on uh, restoring habitats. So we work on restoring rivers, forests, and peatlands, but also bringing back wildlife, uh, bringing back natural grazing, restoring traffic chains, et cetera. Then we have a, a huge part of our work, which is about trying to find ways that um, people can benefit from this, from rewilding and from nature comeback. 
So it's about supporting the transition of local economies, finding business models that make rewilding attractive as a as a as an alternative to more extractive activities, um, bringing access to finance and markets, and providing wider benefits, which can be, for example, supporting local cultures and local local products, etc. Then uh, there's a big aspect of building engagement and communication. Um, the idea is to re-inspire and reach out to large audiences to try to foster these engagements uh, and you know bring people to follow this this movement, uh, empowering communities and proving, providing a new identity and pride. And finally, the la last aspect is uh, looking outside of our landscapes and really scaling up the rewilding movement across Europe. So we have an entire team who's um, working on developing and applying upscaling mechanism and tools. Um, and the idea is to have this widespread adoption across, across Europe, um, including bringing in science and policy to enable rewilding. And um, I'm going to be focusing now mostly on the things that I'm working on. It, and it's, it's quite uh, a small box within the bigger rewilding actions. And it's really this uh, work on natural grazing and wildlife comeback and the restoration of trophic chains. So I'm going to do very bad work at you know, representing all of what my colleagues are doing. Um, so this is not all of rewilding Europe. If you had invited someone else, they would have talked about these other aspects, but I'm going to focus because I cannot speak for three hours. So uh, this, is, this is what I will be focusing on. So um, now I'm trying to connect, you know, what, what can we learn from theory, but how does that actually, um, what happens in practice. And I think for me, that was the most important uh, learning that I had during this entire year of working as a practitioner. All these things that I had no idea about that actually take place when you want to rewild a place where we want to bring back a species. All these things that you know we put at the, as a caveat as, at the end of the paper. And of course, we'll have to include local context and, you know, and, and consideration, local considerations, but actually this, this huge world. Uh, that I learned about. So I'm going to try to bring this this aspect and and talk a, a bit more about it. So it's a lot about the challenges for rewilding because there are many. It's about also presenting some opportunities and the examples are mostly from wildlife comeback. I could also have talked about you know the challenges of restoring rivers or peatlands, but uh, it will be focusing a lot on on wildlife comeback. So the first example I wanted to share is. Uh, um, in Romania, in the Southern Carpathian landscape where we work. Um, we're working a lot with bison there, but we wanted to explore other alternatives for bringing back more wild herbivores in these landscapes. So we went there and, and did an assessment and a feasibility study about where and how and when could we do what action. And with my, you know, if you had asked me a year ago, how would you go about it? I would have probably said, well, let's look at the habitat that's there. Let's look at the ecological requirement of the species, maybe do a species distribution model, maybe project it into future climate change to see how the, the suitability is going to change and identify the hotspots that would be the best for the species. And then I've put a, I'll put a caveat at the end and say, yes, and of course we need to take into account the local context and you know, like make it happen. Okay, but this make it happen is actually the big part of it because the ecological side, you know, it's quite straightforward. Um, practitioners and people who live there, they know where the species can be. So, okay, we, we will do uh, this work, but it's, it's really not what is the challenge uh, there. The challenge is to actually have access to the land to do anything. And what I learned there, and maybe some of you find it super obvious and know it already, but I, I learned uh, during this year, is that uh, the main challenge to actually have access to the management of the land, because the, each pixel on this map is really um, being managed by a layer of different rules and different plans. And you, you have to go through all of them to know what exactly you can do. So for example, first obvious one is ownership, whether who owns the land, whether it's public or private. Another one on top of that is the grazing rights. And that will tell you what you can do with domestic animals. If you want to bring back horses, if you want to bring back cattle, what a buffalo, um, it will tell you what you can do. On top of that, on the same area, you'll have the hunting rights and the hunting concessions having their own management plans, which will uh, regulate what, anything that can happen with wild herbivores, so deer, uh, fallow deer, red deer, um, wild boar, etc. So you have to uh, 
be able to you know reach reach this management uh, plan to do anything and on top of that you might have forestry plan that will tell you how the habitat is going to be managed and you, you don't have a power to say to tell the, the forestry uh, authorities how to manage the forest you can try to influence but you're not going to do what you want there um, part of the forestry management plan might be that herbivores are not allowed in forests this is very common uh, in Europe that you cannot have you cannot reintroduce uh, wild uh, domestic herbivores in forests for example so you have to go through all of these layers and then eventually what will dictate what you can do is how your relationship with hunters your relationship with farmers your relationship with the municipality who lets you do something you know and when I was you know working as a researcher and doing these maps of trying to identify the best places to do rewilding one of the assumptions I might have chosen is well I think protected areas would be you know the easiest place to restore nature right well this is not the case <laughs> it differs it varies but protected areas uh, do have conservation management plans that often do not align well with rewilding they might have objectives that are very different from what you you know what you envision as a someone who wants to restore natural processes and in that case for example um, the restoration of herbivores and the reintroduction of herbivores was not a welcome action in protected areas whatsoever they did not want to hear about it because uh, they they had this conservation management plan that was very focused on on plants and on uh, endemic species of plants so they didn't want any herbivore to be reintroduced so what happens in the end is that well we're not going to work with protected areas we're going to work with hunters and that's an unlikely partner I would say if you if you're not you know if you're thinking about it uh, from a distant place um, but not all of them but some hunters are actually very keen to reintroduce uh, wild animals wild herbivores because they're not they, they actually don't want to hunt them to the last one they want to have a healthy population of wild animals that are you know doing their role and they're they love their area and they love they've been they live there their whole life and they're really willing to help us um bring back animals so in that case our best partner was a was a hunter and then you need to find creative solution and in some of these landscapes uh the local our, our teams are actually registered as hunters they don't hunt but then that gives them access to the hunting management plan or they're registered as farmers they don't farm but that gives them access to the right to own uh, grazing animals and to and to manage them so it's really a creative mix of you know solutions that you have to find to actually make rewilding happen on the ground another challenge is animal availability and again we have we we well, I used when I used to work as a as an academic I would um, you know be uh, involved or or read or see a lot of papers uh, based a lot on modeling so we would have this assumption that we're going to bring back all the animals where they used to be at natural density levels and then we will calculate all sorts of measures about uh, carbon or about uh, sea dispersal about whatever processes we're looking into but we have this assumption well the reality is that it's really difficult to create large numbers we still uh, we can bring back diversity we can bring back different species but bringing back abundance of each of these species is really challenging. It's a really long process and it's not gonna happen overnight. So for example, this picture on the right there is uh, from bison in Southern Carpathians in Romania. And it's a really, really successful um, story. It started years ago and we, the, the team reintroduced bison also in collaboration with WWF. And today we have 150 bison uh, roaming free in this area. Uh, I think half of them were born in the wild and we'll keep reinforcing this population, but it's it's a great success story. Um, it's still very, very few bison. With 150 animals, you barely start to have a viable population. You barely start to see some impacts on the environment, but you're not going to, you know, it's it's not enough. We, we need to we need to keep doing it. And species like bison, species like Przewalski horses um, that have gone through this major bottleneck in the past, they're really difficult to, to bring back. We have very few of them. In Europe, so everyone who wants to uh, bring back bison, they have to fight, you know, every year, how many can I have this year? So every year we might have 10 that we can reintroduce. So 10 by 10, slowly we're trying to rebuild these populations. And we have to think about the genetics and having genetic diversity and so on. Um, this Przewalski have been reintroduced in, in Spain. Also a really nice story that's just starting. It was this year we released the first uh, free roaming herd of Przewalski in Western Europe. Really exciting, but again, 
we bring them 10 at a time or 20 at a time if we're lucky. So it's going to take some time. And this last picture is a picture is in uh, Ukraine where uh, we reintroduced hulan or wild has. And this is also a species that has very few individuals in Europe. And it happens that the place where we sourced these animals is now under Russian occupation. So we cannot bring more. Uh, we don't have access to the area. So all the plans to, to reinforce this Kulan population are now on hold. So you also have geopolitical aspects, of course, that, uh, that, that are to be taken into account. And um, here I just want to introduce uh, that we are uh, working on uh, building this tool at Rewilding Europe that will be called the Natural Grazing Facility. And it will be a tool that hopefully will help uh, with the connecting demand and supply of animals throughout Europe. Because the sad story is that you still have a lot of animals that are killed, uh, killed in one area because you have overpopulation in a, in a fenced area where these animals could be transported and, and brought here where they're needed. So we're trying to connect this demand and supply. And yeah, this tool will be, will be launched. And uh, I think it will be an interesting um, tool for anyone working with natural grazing in Europe. So if that's your case, uh, please reach out. Another challenge for rewilding is uh, it's quite obvious. It's gathering local support, because if you don't have local support, you're bound to fail. This is an example uh, of a very uh, tragic event that happens, happened in Italy a few months ago, where this, uh, this bear female was shot. And uh, it's, it's a bit tragic because the population is only about 60 bears, so one reproductive fem female was a really big deal to lose. Um, it's a big blow to the to the project and to the population, but that goes to show that um, you know you can't you can't force yourself uh, uh, through uh, not having local support. It's it's really important if you want um, a project to be viable over the long term. So what we do and what we you know what is important is to always have wildlife comeback coming hand in hand with strong coexistence plans and bringing local communities from the beginning. There are many ways to do that. There are very good guidelines that are provided uh, that were published recently by the ICN Species Group. Um, at Rewilding Europe, we work a lot with this concept of wildlife smart communities. This is a, a concept that was brought from North America, um, from British Columbia, where they work with the bear smart communities. And we try to adapt it to the European context. And it's basically um, a form of uh, landscape scale governance system of trying to bring different stakeholders to take their share into dealing with this uh, conflict prone species. So bringing in governance system that allows to prevent, but also respond to conflict. Um, there's also a lot about, um, you know, having compensation, having education programs and supporting local businesses and local producers, and also providing just support in terms of mitigating conflict. For example, we our team in, in Italy, they, they can provide fences for apiaries, they can provide fences for orchards so to reduce conflict with bear or uh, bear-proof bins, these kind of things that can reduce conflict and they can over time gather a bit more support from the local community. And of course, stakeholder engagement is a, is a big one. And finally, this one, which is maybe the, the biggest challenge of all, is just the bureaucracy. It's a, it's a bit of a nightmare. There's many layers of governance for each action that you want to to take uh, permits and authorization can take months or years to obtain. And I put this picture of a water buffalo here because it's a, it's a very recent example um, in Romania where we're trying, to, we, we're trying to bring water buffalo to the Danube Delta, to the Romanian side. And these animals have been uh, locked uh, in, a, in a farm for months and months because of just trying to obtain permits just to move them within the country and bring them to, to the Danube Delta. Um, it's just, uh, yeah, in, in that particular case, they need the, the permit document with authorizations to be stamped and approved by every ministry in the country, not just the environmental ministry, all of them separately. So that takes, that takes a long time. It's really difficult. Uh, fortunately, we have local teams that are really knowledgeable and that are here to push through and to, uh, and to try to, to go through all this bureaucracy. But it's a lot of work and it's a, it's a big barrier, I would say, to rewilding. And there are other aspects, of course, all of these cost a lot of money you have to find the funding. Transporting animals throughout Europe is not straightforward. You have a lot of, again, uh, permits to get to cross borders, etc. 
Um, in the case of domestic animals that you might use for natural grazing, horses or cattle or water buffaloes, uh, you'll need to manage the herd. Of course, you can't just let them go and, and let them do their thing. You're, you're legally responsible for these animals. And there is a lot of health and welfare regulations, um, which, you know, they, they come a lot from the uh, livestock industry. And I'm, I'm very glad that there are welfare regulations for, for livestock. In the case of rewilding, we live a bit in this gray zone of these free living animals that are semi wild. And some of the regulations are just not really appropriate for, for, for that type of management where you might have to, uh, to tag a, a newborn calf within the three days that it was born. And if you're working in a 5,000 hectare area, this is just not going to happen. So all of these, um, legislative aspects that are, that are a bit difficult and constraining what we can do with rewilding. Um, are other challenges for which we, we constantly try to find creative solutions. And I'm just uh, highlighting for anyone who might be interesting that in terms of funding, the European Wildlife Comeback Fund is a financing uh, tool that Rewilding Europe is offering that I'm actually managing. So you can reach out to me. Uh, it applies to anyone who's um, doing a reintroduction of keystone species in Europe. There's a set of criteria, of course, and conditions, but uh, but it's a it's a nice funding mechanism, um, and we've been able to fund, for example, the release of lynxes. The dung beetles were funded by this, and uh, so it goes it covers all kinds of species as long as they are keystone uh, in their environment. All right, and I'll just um, cover. Sorry, I'll just drink. I'll just finish by covering a bit of um, avenues for research and, and policy that we identified are uh, important. They're not, it's not all of them. There's a lot that can be done. There's a lot that should be done. Um, but a few that, you know, to enable rewilding, uh, we thought would be, would be interesting to showcase. So in terms of the research agenda, um, the reality right now is that there's a lot of work uh, coming out on rewilding, but there's a lot of opinion papers and a lot of perspectives, also a lot of modelization studies of what, you know, the potential for rewilding to restore such and such. There's very little empirical studies. Um, and it's, uh, it's a problem because then it becomes very difficult to support our claims. So we, we support, we claim a lot of things about what rewilding can do, but we have very little to actually show it in terms of empirical work. Um, so there's a real need to demonstrate impact on the ground. Um, and I'll, I'll come back to this. But before that, I also want to uh, give a little note of caution that was actually given to me by uh, one of our staff members in one of our teams. Uh, he's been working for a very long time in rewilding. And he wrote this in an email. He said, during the last 12 years, I experienced very often the case that scientists conducted very good studies and were not aware our authorities would misuse their studies for different goals. It is very important to always be aware of the political background and develop a well-reasoned strategy before conducting a study. So these are words by someone who saw sometimes uh, well-intentioned studies backfire. In that particular case, he was referring to a study that uh, showed the um, roadkill uh, of wildlife on roads and show how something needs to be done um, for roadkills in, in a particular area. And it was a very well attention studies. We need to reduce the amount of roadkills. But he said the problem is that the authority have been waiting for these kind of papers to um, support their claim that what actually needs to be done is to build this huge highway because then you can put fences on both sides and you won't have any roadkill. And he's really worried that this, this is something they will misuse for that intent. And then of course you completely divide your landscape in two and you break all connectivity and uh, it completely backfires. Um, another example, which is not what he was referring to here, but what uh, I feel is starting to happen is um, around the, the, all the studies that are coming with a uh, um, large herbivores being a solution for climate change mitigation and storage of carbon. It is very important studies and it really helps also uh, support rewilding and, and give a reason also to rewild, but it can backfire. I'm a bit worried, to be honest, because we start hearing about donors that completely, you know, simplify those studies and ask, okay, so how many kilograms of carbon can your bison store? And <laughs> we're starting to commodify these animals as we did with trees, where an animal is now a potential for 
kilograms of carbon to be stored. And when we know the reality behind it and the and the processes that go behind it, we know it's not that simple. Definitely, we cannot put a number of carbon um, on the bison. It's not how it works. Bison will actually stop eating vegetation and releasing carbon. So uh, if we go down that road, we might have to kill all the animals. So it's uh, it's difficult because I know that these studies are super well intentioned and they are all the caveats uh, and uh, you know recommendations that are very sound. But it is true that it will be taken out of context and it will be stripped of all nuances and used potentially for um, for things that we didn't uh, think about. So just a note of caution that there is a responsibility in um, in publishing research and it's really important to connect with uh, you know local NGOs that are doing work on the ground that they can actually say, well, actually we don't need to hear that, <laughs> but we, we would really need you to work on this. Um, yeah, and so coming back to this need to demonstrate impact on the ground, um, at Rewilding Europe, we've actually uh, looked into ways to develop our monitoring framework and trying to find ways to measure our impact, um, the ecological impact, but also impact in terms of wider benefits for uh, human societies in terms of pride and attitude, et cetera, and also the eco economic benefits. And again, again, here, I won't be speaking about things I'm uh, not directly involved with, so I'll be focusing on, on the ecological impact monitoring. And we have partnered this year with uh, the Zoological Society of London to uh, develop a monitoring framework for ecological impact. And just very briefly, this is where we're at. We've identified rewilding models that we're working on, um, on different types of habitat or different types of actions, such as restoring trophic chains or restoring natural grazing or coexistence. And for each of these models, we've um, developed these series of change that really tell you what ecological impacts we, we want to demonstrate. We have identified potential indicators and metric and methods. We've gone through uh, doing cost-benefit analysis to identify which ones are the most cost-effective. For knowledge gaps, we relied on expert interviews. Um, and then we've selected really a range of indicators, metric and methods that were the most relevant um, for our objectives, for our actions, for the local teams, because they all have different needs. And the idea is to develop this framework for each um, each landscape for each of these models that they are working on. And so to, a, to some extent, we there's a lot of these methods and metrics that we can conduct ourselves that will be done by the landscapes themselves. But there are some that are really such at the edge of um, scientific knowledge that an NGO, you know, like Rewilding Europe uh, will not be tackling. We just will, we are not a research institute. So we're not going to be looking into these things that are still really in the, you know, in development in terms of the methods or even in terms of the understanding of the processes. And that's why I think there is a potential for um, research uh, to play a role there. So we are quite uh, welcome to discuss potential work together on long term monitoring for especially these uh, these topics that are really at the edge of research. I was talking with um, um, people from the group there about um, healthy the health of soils or about carbon storage or about ecosystem metabolism. These are things that we're not going to be looking into, but would be really interesting uh, to have long-term research studies on this topic. Um, we would also really like to see if uh, the monitoring framework we're developing can be integrated with existing frameworks, aligning with standards or aligning with uh, existing uh, biodiversity observa observatories for rewilding sites. I think it'd be nice also we're, we're uh, reluctant to test technology ourselves because this is a lot of uh, money and time, but we're really interested to know if these emerging technologies have a potential to measure what they say they can measure. Um, some recent uh, remote sensing products, uh, environmental DNA, soundscapes, the interpretation of camera trap images through AI, uh, these type of things. And of course, it's also always nice to be involved, uh, you know, in, in publications and being able to have our voice also represented. Um, and just, yeah, I mean, this, this one has been working quite well right now where we can reach out to uh, researchers and try to get expert feedback and advice on our work. 
So by any means, uh, we have we have field sites and we have local partners, and there are a few key topics that we're interested to work on. And uh, if that rings a bell, and if you think uh, you would like to chat about it, uh, let's get in touch. I cannot uh, promise uh, that you know what what will happen, but at least uh, it's a nice conversation to start with the with the research community. And finally, uh, this is less of my expertise, but. Uh, we've also identified uh, key topics in, in policy making and uh, legal aspects for rewilding that could really enable rewilding to happen, uh, boundaries that we need to, to push, uh, laws that we need to change. A big topic is uh, how to secure land for the long term. Um, I showed you this layered management of, of land. And even when you get into these um, you know, the ability to influence management it might still only be for a three year, five year period. And then you always run the risk of not being able to renew um, the type of actions that you're doing there. So it would be really nice to find ways to secure land for the long term. There's a lot also that can be done with the, with CAP, with the Common Agricultural Policy. Uh, there are actually at uh, European level, these eco schemes that are supporting to some level rewilding, they're not often translated into national policies and, and regulations. And that's where there's a, a work of, you know, of lobbying to try to include this, um, these eco schemes into international policy and try also to help uh, people on the ground to have access to these, to these subsidies because it's a, it's, it's a difficult uh, process and it's always nice to have support to, to figure out our way through the through the jungle there there's also a need to push the legal legal framework for kept and domestic herbivores as i said it can be really challenging to follow the rules for um domestic herbivores it's not always in line with what rewilding is is about or even the what is beneficial for these species for these individuals um there's also the question of carcass deposition. It's actually quite difficult right now to leave a dead animal on the ground, even though we know that it fulfills a lot of uh, roles in the system uh, for scavengers, but also for nutrient cycling, for uh, lots of biodiversity that's related to these carcasses. So pushing the um, legal framework for, for carcass deposition would be also, a, it's an important topic. And just in general, finding a way around these challenges to obtain permits. And Rewilding Europe has been partnering already with a Lifescape project with uh, environmental law uh, experts that are helping us uh, find ways. So they're looking at case studies and, and topics and they're helping us find ways to really enable rewilding. If you're interested on, the, on their website, they have this rewilding law hub where they provide a lot of recommendations for pushing rewilding in, in different areas and on different topics. So it's a great partnership, um, but we can do more and we're open to, to have more support there um, because in the end, uh, this, is not, this is not what we are doing. We, we, this is a place where we need to have partnerships and we need to have support from people who are actually involved in, in legal work, in policy making, in lobbying, et cetera. So just to finish on some key messages. Um, so rewilding practice is indeed inspired by scientific knowledge. I'm quite convinced of that, but I've also learned that what happens on the ground is ultimately driven by local context and opportunities. So um, we always need to be true to remember uh, that collaborations with researchers and policymakers is important to create an enabling, enabling environment for rewilding. And that's something that Rewilding Europe at least is happy to engage with and happy to collaborate on. And um, the last note is about this fact that uh, if you're willing to do applied science, it really must respond to actual problems on the ground. And for that, it's really difficult to actually know what are these problems if you're not talking to local practitioners, local partners. And it's uh, really nice to involve from the beginning in project design, in the design of research project, to involve these local partners who will be able to say, well, this is actually really the one thing we need right now to move forward is, is to work on this. So by any means, there's a lot of science that doesn't need to do that. There's a lot of science that doesn't have to be applied. It doesn't have to be connected to local partners. But um, if you wish for your science to be connected and to have impact, I would really recommend uh, reaching out to, to local NGOs as early as possible in the process. And with that, I'll thank you very much for attention.
Thank you, Sophie. That was a really wonderful overview of the work. And also just really nice to see so much practical hands-on just getting on with it and then and seeing what the science tells us and the practice tells us uh, in that process. So we'll open up to questions now. I'll, I'll just uh, kick off with one. Uh, perhaps it's a hard one because you've only been with them for with Rewilding Europe for a year. But over the lifetime of Rewilding Europe, you know, how have perceptions generally in different countries across Europe changed about the concept of rewilding? Is it something that's getting more traction in public discourse or is there more hostility as people solidify their positions more on, on this? Well, it's actually something that we really start to want to measure uh, effectively. Uh, we're trying to really measure how the attitude towards rewilding is changing. So I'm not aware that we have a, a real, uh, you know, like like data on this topic of be really being able to say uh, in which direction it has gone. I only know of um, stories and anecdotes, for example, in, in Croatia, where our team is, um, they're effectively registers as hunters and they manage hunting concessions. And you can imagine how at the beginning from the local, from the other hunting concessions around, it was a bit, uh, you know, there's a bit of a reluctance to see this, this organization starting to take over these hunting management plans and replacing hunting by wildlife watching hides and stuff like that. Uh, so a lot of reluctance and criticism. And then what we see now is that these other hunting concessions are actually starting to come and ask, okay, so I see that you have a lot more animals and <laughs> actually the wildlife hides are working very well and bringing money. So maybe we could learn from that and do it. So there is there is a spread of, you know, and like this is de demonstrating role of, of our teams that then can catalyze uh, others to do the same and to follow. But I'm sure there's also examples of people who, who are still really against and you'll always have people who are really reluctant and really against. So, so I think the position of Rewilding Europe is not to try to convince this, you know, this group of people that are always going to be very vocal and against, but to try to bring in those people that are in the middle, that are not yet sure, that are maybe, but need to be convinced and try to do the work and through demonstration and showing that it's working, um, then try to bring in. And, and I think there's been a lot of examples of that. Um, yeah. Great. Great. I think we can open up to the floor now. Any questions? Uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, yeah. <laughs> Hi, um, I was wondering if you have like any rule or principle on to, to select which species to prioritize to introduce or reintroduce or like just yes. that's yeah. my question. Yeah, yeah, yeah good Thanks. question. Um, well, as I said, rewilding is uh, is getting inspiration from the past. So it's important to know what was there before and what was lost. And, and then we'll focus on the ecological functions that were lost. So it's not necessarily the identity of the species. If the species is still, you know, that was missing there, is still extant somewhere else, and you can bring animals from a healthy population and, and restore them here, by any means it's good. But for, in some cases, species are just gone extinct. So we might use some functional analogs for these species, for example, um, the European wild horse is extinct, but we have domestic horses. And so we can rewild domestic horses and bring them here. Um, the European water buffalo is extinct, but we have another species of water buffalo that we might bring in. So we work with these functional analogs and then um, see you know, uh, the ecological conditions there. And then we work with pragmatism. So what is actually post possible? Um, we're not gonna necessarily try to reach out for the impossible, but you know, start with what is uh, feasible where we can get permits where we think it's a uh, um, something that is you know achievable in the short term and then of course there'll be feasibility studies involved to see that all the conditions are there for the species um, yeah yeah yeah, I think it's not a matter of whether it was too long ago, because the ecosystems that we have today in Europe, they've evolved for millions of years with these animals. So whether, I think it'd be a bit ridiculous to decide that, you know, the 1700s or the 1500s are the time where it was natural, and we should just focus on that. No, we look at what was, what was the system like uh, for millions of years until these very recent extinctions that happened, you know, it, it was in terms of geological time, it was in a blink of an eye, and try to understand what functions we are missing. So it's not that we're going to necessarily reintroduce the lion, 
but it's important to know that this function is missing, that we don't have these large carnivores, or we are missing elephants. We're not necessarily going to bring back elephants, but we know that these huge megafauna that were able to knock down trees and really have an impact and trample and everything, they are missing. And that's important. And then we might just focus on the, the next best thing, which is the, the next bigger animals, which might be the bison or the, the auroch which, for which we're using analog um, an analog um, like a mix of breed of cattle, the taros that is the analog of the auroch or as close as we can get for now. So we were trying to get the next best. Um, so we will, I know this is not a time in, in in a point in time in the past, we say, okay, we want to get back there. We're definitely not getting back there anyway, but it's, ins it's inspiring us to know what's missing. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much. So my question links a little bit to um, Yudvinda's. So the term itself, rewilding, has obviously become hugely political. If you drive into um, Macuntleth in North Wales, Mid Wales, near where I live, there's a big sign that says "De Dimi Ailwhiltiar," which is "Say No to Rewilding." And it's become deeply, deeply the whole term rewilding has become associated with the idea of excluding people, which obviously isn't inherently part of the concept um, necessarily. Um, particularly the term that you the, the concept you're presenting is very much around bringing back extinct um parts of the um the wildlife community and then re re that allow processes to start again but i guess my question is what it's maybe it's a little bit of a banal question but it's around branding i guess in conservation so things come out in and out of fashion do you think the particularly maybe it's just the uk context where the term has become so unhelpful that we almost need a rebranding of the concept so that it, to, to get away from the the kind of um the baggage that's become associated with it to allow people to move forward positively into a shared future of you know nature and people in harmony or whatever so i just i just wonder yeah, about yeah. that yeah um so I think it's not a strict black and white answer. I don't think we should give up the word rewilding because some people are against it because some people are against everything. <laughs> you know, like you cannot always, you'll never make everyone happy. So you'll always have people that are angry at it, that are uh, misinterpreting it. Uh, for example, the argument that rewilding is excluding people has not been my experience at all. So are we going to quit the name because people are misunderstanding the concept? I would say no. But that being said, if you are trying to reach out to a certain stakeholder that is, uh, you know, really so focused on the name and so willing to, you know, not even start a discussion because you're using the word rewilding. Then, okay, by any means, you can call it something else uh, to to reach out to that person. And I think the important thing is to explain what you're doing. Then later down the line, you can say, well, by the way, that was our definition of rewilding from the beginning. But explain what you're doing that people start to understand that maybe they had a misconception of it, um, such as rewilding is excluding people, and, and convince people through this, this longer explanation, this actual definition and showing your action and showing that, well, what we are doing is actually such and such and such. It has brought so many benefits. It has, you know, this is how it works and and, and, and. and then you get people to eventually maybe follow you if, if they don't, well, you know, by any means uh, they shouldn't necessarily decide what you're going to do next. And then bring back the world rewilding. I don't think we should give it up altogether. Um, I'm French. In France, the world rewilding is really difficult also. Uh, the French translation is no better. Rien sauvagement means uh, to re-savage the land. So are you going to use this one? I think there's a huge, I mean, I think it's important to to wonder about, about uh, names and about perceptions, but also to not give up too quickly because of some vocal people that will put sign on the road. They don't necessarily represent everyone. So, yeah. Thank you. Um, that was really nice. Thank you so much. Well, the one thing I was struggling with is because these animals have, you know, in the past, they um, evolved their, the, the time when they were actually in these areas. It was very different. And I don't, I'm not familiar enough with a lot of these landscapes, but it seems that they've, they're pretty messed up from the kind of, from the bottom up. And so what I was trying to figure out is, you know, if you, if you, 
have introductions kind of from the top down is it you know are they going to just kind of poof out because they don't you haven't started from the bottom up I mean I can certainly understand why you'd want I mean these are great animals and they're so important in a given system but I'm just wondering whether the system itself needs perhaps some attention just to see whether you've got a kind of co-evolved complex that they're capable of kind of moving into and adapting to in the same way as they did in the past. In other words, thinking more holistically about the system mm. that you've got them moving into. Yeah. If that makes um, sense. Yeah, so obviously you don't want to put back animals in a place where they, they couldn't live. Uh, I think that would be eth ethically wrong. So um, by definition, well, I mean, We'll put back animals in a place that where they have a potential to live, and then the idea is that it's a it's a top down action that they will have on the environment that they will themselves improve the environment environment that they're living in. For example, in um, in Spain, what we what we see is that um, you know these are very arid environments. The soils are not necessarily uh, very rich because you haven't had these animals moving around and trampling and pooping and all of that. And you bring back these animals and they start doing this and they start actually improving the soil and improving the vegetation that was growing there uh, to create their own environment that is that is suitable. I'm not saying it's always that simple, uh, but that's the idea is that you find a place where you have the, the basic qualities, of course, and put them back in a place that's been so industrialized that it's been scraped of any vegetation. But with time, the idea is that they will create the enabling environment that will allow themselves to live there and that will allow other species also to come back. Um, so I don't have an example in mind where we've put back species and the population just crashed because they didn't have resources. Um, this, this is not, it's not the idea, of course. I'll take a yeah. comment from online. Yeah. Uh, one from uh, Dustin. Uh, which is, uh, I know the answer to your first part, the first part of this question, which is, are you measuring the effects of rewilding on net greenhouse gas emissions? I believe there's no, but uh, uh, but what are the, but it's the more general one, I think, is how does the cost effectiveness for rewilding compare in terms of tons of CO2 to managing landscapes, uh, for, for actively managing them for carbon? Is Dustin asking me for an actual value? Actual uh, I, think it's, I think it's more perhaps. A, yes, a yes, because I don't have a number to put on that. Uh, um, I don't think anyone does. Uh, I think this would have to go through some some modeling exercise uh, because it is so difficult to measure at the moment on the grounds. Uh, how much can you really compare? Uh, you would need to have a, a nice experiment design and you need to really follow up on the long term also because the benefit of rewilding in terms of uh, emissions and carbon storage are over a very long period of time. So I don't think we're even there where we can already come and see really the a huge difference or a difference that would be significantly important. Mm -hmm. um, but hopefully we'll get there. But no, I don't have a value to put on that. Yeah. Well, I th well, I think you answered it partially in the talk and it's a point mm -hmm. I really strongly agree on. I think professing rewilding around carbon is actually quite dangerous because mm -hmm. it might blow up in your faces. Uh, it's a but uh, it's very unclear what the carbon benefits of rewilding are. Yeah, and even uh, if they are, uh, I think the, the methods are still maybe not yeah. there to measure it. So then you yeah, so. you might have an action that is going to be positive for, for carbon and for climate, but you cannot really show it because the measurements, which are a lot about below ground carbon, for example, are not even, the methods are still being developed. So that, that's the risky part, I think, it being asked to show results immediately when we don't even have the means to show it really right now. Yeah. Okay, I'll actually take one one for online, then I'll head back. Uh, this is from Joshua Day Davis. Uh, thanks for the insightful talk. We often raise the point of meaningful engage, meaningfully engaging farmers, landscape managers, in the practice of re nature recovery and rewilding. What skills are needed for these actors to do so with the scale and pace required to facilitate restoration, and how do we ensure that? What are the skills people need to to do this uh, uh, engagement with local stakeholders? I'm not sure what about the what the scale uh, is referring to the well we have to do it because you know it's, uh, the skill ah, to do skill, it at scale skill, so um, yeah. you need to do it but you also need to do it at, at a scale that, yes that, okay that, that uh, stops these being boutique projects and, and you need to have the skills it. also yeah. Yeah. so yes skills and scale the skill and scale <laughs> um yeah no uh, that's a good question and um I think what we I think that's where the, the approach of rewilding Europe to work at this landscape scale is really interesting because then you can really try to reach uh, you can really try to create a network of of stakeholders around an area because these animals are moving. Like it's not about the bear having an impact 
on that orchard. It's about the bear having an impact on the entire area. And so having this work where you can start to influence and create um, um, engagement and mediation maybe over a large landscape scale, I think is, is quite uh, powerful. But I think it can happen from anywhere from someone's garden all the way to national and EU level uh, working on this, uh, working on these coexistence aspects. But our approach is to work at yeah, a landscape of uh, connected municipalities and stakeholders that uh, are facing a conflict with a species and trying to work all together to, to react and prevent conflict. Mm. Yeah. Great. I'll open up that over there. Um, so you'd mentioned that we have um, that there's sort of obviously inequalities in terms of uh, coexistence with megafauna between the global south and, glo and the global north but um, I was thinking sort of within the EU as well um, as we sort of start to do more rewilding, how do you prevent um, similar inequalities happening within the EU, for example? Um, so like, how do you prevent, for example, all the richer countries in the EU just offloading all of this stuff to um, like, you know, Eastern Europe or things like that? Yeah, uh, no, that's a very good question. I think it also even happens within within a country where you might have uh, rural areas that are dubbed as, this is the place where we're going to restore nature, but without necessarily considering uh, the people that live there so this inequality can be really uh, translated at many levels um that's where a lot of our work is also is is about trying to not do rewilding despite people but with with people and trying to bring uh, viable alternatives to people to maintain their livelihoods in those landscapes with rewilding so that means finding alternative ways of financing uh trying to replace their revenue with something that is not based on extractive measures, uh, but trying trying to bring people. So there's a lot of work about with local producers uh, trying to connect their work to rewilding friendly practices and support their products and find, you know, support local businesses, allow them to have access to markets and subsidies, et cetera. So it's all about trying to provide alternative ways of maintaining their livelihood. Um, I would say, and yeah. Hi, um, thank you very much for the talk. Um, I'm just wondering, so you've got your 10 sites. Um, when you select them, do you gather a local public opinion on whether they would like rewilding happening or um, like whether they're keen or not, is that a factor deciding um, in deciding which site you're going to select? Yeah, yeah, that's an excellent question. And of course, I wasn't there at the beginning of Rewilding Europe, but um, I was happy to learn that it's very much a bottom-up approach. So these landscapes are not chosen by Rewilding Europe to be the next landscape. They are nominated from local organizations. There was a call for nomination at the beginning and it's still ongoing. So any local organization that thinks that they're Re, um, areas of potential for rewilding can connect with rewilding Europe and say, hey, we think this is a good place. We already have uh, done all this work to look, you know, speak with stakeholders. Uh, we have a lot of support. We have a lot of actions that we could do. And then what happens is that if it if it sounds very promising, there will be a, a feasibility study um, that will run and, and look at, you know, what can be done and what would be the first step. And that's how these landscapes were born. They were born from um, nominations. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, so we, we speak quite a lot about rewilding here in the context of the UK and wider within Europe. But in Portugal, for instance, it's not so much a thing. We have Coa Valley and we speak about rewilding. But nonetheless, we all the work with the Iberian lynx, for instance, uh, it, uh, it's about bringing back a top predator. It's about ecosystem functioning and so on. But it's framed quite differently. So it's framed around... Uh, um, Reintro uh, reintroductions, habitat restoration. So uh, interventions that we were doing for quite a long time and are well established within conservation science. And uh, so my question is, um, there's a lot of uh, framing and branding associated uh, with rewilding. So 
if you would um, try to distinguish between rewilding and more conventional approaches within conservation, what would be the key attribute that would separate both? And to what extent do you think that it's a, it's a, it's just a different framing? It's just looking at the same issues from a different set of lenses. Um, just, yeah, what, yeah. what are your views on that? Yeah. Um, so I think it's different, different, but overlapping very much. Uh, for sure, you might have a similar action that falls both into restoration and rewilding. But the main difference between the two is the focus of rewilding on trying to bring back natural processes that will, you know, uh, that's a trophic rewilding approach, or it's not just about trophic rewilding, it's all about also passive rewilding, but trying to bring these natural processes that will allow uh, the ecosystems to, you know, run itself and be resilient and be biodiverse. And there's not this idea of this fixed image that we're trying to recreate. So it's in that sense differs from restoration, which is looking at the past and, and trying to go back to a, a status of the system as it was in the past and having this trick, you know, this image that we're trying to get back to. So rewilding doesn't really have an image associated to it at the end. It has this open-ended approach where we're, you know, looking to be surprised with what will actually happen when you bring back these ecosystem processes uh, in the system. And I think that's the, one of the biggest uh, difference is, uh, yeah, and so it means also not so much focus on um, threatened species, for example. It's not, we're, we're looking at the keystone aspect of the species. Is it going to have disproportionate impact on this environment? Not necessarily trying to save the species, which is also important and a, a different questions and tackled by other organizations. But at Rewilding, we're really focusing on um, on keystone species uh, that not necessarily threatened. That's why we also bring back horses by no means a threatened species, uh, but they're they're fulfilling a role in the system. So that's in that sense quite different. But I agree, there's a lot of overlap, of course. Hi, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to ask a question, building up on our question that's been asked before about uh, the how ready is an environment or one of those ten uh, to host new animals or maybe a bigger population and and processes uh, that these um, species will bring. But species, and hopefully, uh, would then move and would disperse broader. And that will affect, obviously, the areas nearby that might not have been assessed on the first instance and might create problems that might not have uh, occurred there before. Mm. So I was wondering how would you deal with these, mm. uh, with these issues and if the idea would then be to let the rewildness happen just naturally or keep having a sort of management of the of the environment or not just in the area that you mm. originally selected but on a broader scale yeah thank you yeah well i think that's the objective huh? if uh, if we want to have any kind of meaningful impact we need to scale up so i hope that what we're doing in the landscape will spread around it i don't think we want to manage to keep these actions to happen just within the landscape. We want them to spread, but we want to prepare the ground for this to be accepted. And that's where the, the demonstration role is important to show you know, how it can be done. That's how, how the, the groundwork on allowing coexistence in some place can be replicated in another place uh, where the species is not yet, but we can guide people on how to prepare for the comeback because it's going to spread. And this is already happening. And I think it's a good thing. Um, and these landscape will work also places where you can learn. You can eventually, you know, and everyone will make mistakes and maybe some things will work less and something will work better. And then we can spread the knowledge on this. So yeah, that's the big role of this upscaling um, team that we have, yeah. Yeah, uh, we're going to 6.30, so I think she give Sophie a break and a glass of wine. Uh, uh, but thank you very much. I mean, I think uh, to me on reflection, I think one of the, key things that's coming from the work of rewilding Europe is actually going to this thing of uh, detoxifying that word in, in some constituencies by showing in practice how rewilding works with communities can benefit people and and restore these, these keystone species and there's a lot of perspective pieces on one side or the other in the literature but only now are we seeing significant scaling up of practice and mm. I think it's really mm. rewilding Europe is playing a critical role in doing that increasing system so congratulations on your work and the organization's well, work me, but, uh, <laughs> yeah everyone up there <laughs> so thank you